This campaign was unlike any other. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. And he was written off as soon as he began. The Republican Party is not going to nominate Donald Trump. I think this is a, a stunt for attention. Yet, overlooked Americans were getting on board. I hope it can save my job. We need someone to take a sledgehammer to this bull****. And in the end, Donald Trump beat the odds. This election year is not about ideology, it's about insurgency. But the opposition isn't going away. How will it all play out? When you're in the White House, you're drinking from a fire hose 24 hours a day. We can work together and unify our great country. Fox News reporting, the Trump revolution. And now, Brent Baer. Donald Trump president a political earthquake a lot of people still can't believe it but we've been covering this political revolution from the start so while america is still catching its breath we thought we'd explain how we got here and where we may be going next on election day tattoo artist bob holmes of seabrook new hampshire did something he had never done before in his 48 years he voted Walked in there, it was very awkward. I didn't know where to go, what to do, who to talk to. I obviously looked lost because somebody came over and talked to me and uh, told me what line to get into and went into the behind the curtain and, and voted and took a picture on my phone and posted it on Facebook that I voted for Donald Trump. How's it going? So far, so good. Holmes earned some notoriety during the campaign by offering free tattoos of Trump. Trump wins 2016. Trump wins 2016. So on election eve, he stayed up all night watching. This is us. This is our country. It's real. How do we explain how this is possible? I don't know that he really has a plan. I love the fact that the, uh, that the media and the anchors were, were freaking out and just couldn't take it. Holmes says he had switched on Fox News at 2.40 in the morning when we made the call. Donald Trump will be the 45th president of the United States. I don't think I've been that excited since I was probably 12 years old and I got up for Christmas. That literally was the feeling that I had. Bob Holmes was one of millions of Americans who contributed to a shockwave that is still rattling the country coast to coast. So when Donald Trump emerged from his headquarters to give his victory speech, it seemed like the world had changed. Now it's time for America to bind the wounds of division, we have to get together. After a notably divisive campaign, he spoke words of unification. For those who have chosen not to support me in the past, of which there were a few people, I'm reaching out to you for your guidance and your help so that we can work together and unify our great country. The next day, President-elect Trump met with President Obama at the White House. That meeting seemed to signal a more cordial tone as well. This was a meeting that was going to last for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. The meeting lasted for almost an hour and a half. And it could have, as far as I'm concerned, it could, could have gone on for a lot longer. I don't think he is ideological. I think ultimately is he's pragmatic. And that can serve him well as long as he's got good people around him and he has a, a clear sense of direction. I very much look forward to dealing with the president in the future, including counsel. We the but half of the country was unhappy with the outcome of the election. Quite a few celebrities, some of whom had said they'd leave the country if Trump won, appeared shaken. It's easy to say, throw in the towel on that we're going to leave, yeah, or I'm going to move to Spain, because I want to move to Spain. I really, really want to move to Spain right now. Students across the U.S. staged mass walkouts, and thousands took to the streets to show they still opposed Trump, no matter the election results. These marches sometimes devolved into violence. Even as some tried to prevent it, President-elect Trump was preparing to move into the White House by picking his team. There was some controversy when Governor Chris Christie was replaced by Vice President-elect Mike Pence to head the transition. 
Kellyanne Conway, Trump's campaign manager, now turned senior advisor to the transition, thinks the press has made too much of this. So many of the stories that have been artificially generated about transitioning chaos remind me of the pre-election coverage, which was, I have a conclusion, now I'll search for the evidence. In a nod to the GOP establishment, one of Trump's first decisions was to name RNC chairman Reince Priebus as his chief of staff. But he stirred up controversy again when he named Steve Bannon, who helped manage his campaign, as his senior counselor and White House chief strategist. By placing a champion of white supremacists a step away from the Oval Office, what message does Trump send to the young girl who woke up Wednesday morning in Rhode Island afraid to be a woman of color in America? This is the last refuge of the scoundrels, calling people racist. Democratic strategist Pat Cadell has known Steve Bannon for years. Steve Bannon is neither racist, he believes that the United States must put its interests first rather than being globalist first, and that is not a big xenophobic attitude. His sin is that he's anti-establishment. President Bush's senior advisor, Karl Rove, says he has a more fundamental concern about the arrangement between Priebus, the GOP insider, and Bannon, the controversial outsider. Now we have two co-equal people running the West Wing, which means that they better be very close, have a very a collaborative style. When you're in the White House, you're drinking from a fire hose 24 hours a day. And you need to have processes in place that help the president get all the information he needs for a considered decision. And that requires a well-operating West Wing, not one that's at war with itself. Since then, President-elect Trump has kept busy meeting with prospects, and he's chosen several names for prominent slots. Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama for Attorney General. There is controversy. 30 years ago, he was denied a federal judgeship because of alleged racist statements. Sessions denied the allegations. Meanwhile, in another sign of reaching out to his rivals, Trump met with former governor, and former GOP nominee Mitt Romney. Though the two have exchanged harsh words this election cycle. Donald Trump is a phony, a fraud. Mitt is a failed candidate. He failed. He failed horribly. The process of picking his team is continuing, but no matter who is chosen, Trump's supporters can't wait for their man to take over. Drain the swamp! Drain the swamp! There was high hope that as an outsider, he'd keep his promises to build a wall, to fight corruption, and to repeal Obamacare. I expect him to follow through on, I'd like at least 80, 85 percent of what he said. I don't know, the other 15 percent, I think is always somewhat negotiable in anything. I kept saying, this election year is not about ideology, it's about insurgency. Ours was not a campaign, but rather an incredible and great movement made up of millions of hard-working men and women who love their country and want a better, brighter future for themselves and for their family. While Donald Trump is busy preparing for the biggest job in the world, it's hard to believe that a year and a half ago, he was a blip on the political radar. Some people called him a joke who would amuse us until the serious contenders took over. How that joke turned around next. How do you run for president when the field is crowded and you've never held office before? First, you have to get noticed, something Donald Trump was an expert at. My father, Donald J. Trump. It was a setting that may have seemed more appropriate for a Vegas act than a president to be. But on June 16th, 2015, in Trump Tower, Donald Trump had something very important to say to America. Ladies and gentlemen, I am officially running for president of the United States, and we are going to make our country great again. The 69-year-old billionaire real estate mogul had never held office, but now he was going for all the marbles. 
Beyond the announcement, one section of his speech got almost all the attention. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. This was not how candidates normally spoke. Pundits announced his campaign dead on arrival. How should Republicans handle Donald Trump? Uh, ignore him. He's not going to win the Republican nomination. I really don't think that it's what the Republican Party needs. But Trump kept it up, banging the immigration drum. I will build a great, great wall on our southern border, and I will have Mexico pay for that wall. Yeah. Mark my words. Yeah. The line became fodder for countless punchlines. Now, how are you going to deal with immigration? Build a giant wall. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about the economy? Build a giant wall. Yet his tough talk struck a chord. And nobody builds walls better than me, believe me. By mid-July, Trump shot to the top of a crowded Republican field. His freewheeling style got the lion's share of media attention. For instance, no one makes fun of a war hero except Donald Trump, here talking about John McCain. He's not a war hero. He's a war hero. He's a war Five hero. And a He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. Once again, the pundits counted him out. He needs to apologize, and it remains to be seen if he's got sense enough to do that. He's not going to be a viable candidate. You can't say the kinds of things you can over a period of time without crashing and burning. Instead, his polling improved. Everyone else, bing. What would make other candidates radioactive only seemed to make him stronger. There was the comment he made in Rolling Stone magazine about Carly Fiorina. He said, quote, look at that face. Would anyone vote for that? But Remember Trump's the position atop the polls Remember remained the firm. Though there were a few twists and turns ahead, by late May, Trump had secured his party's nomination. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. I am your voice. And after the Republican National Convention in late July, he had pulled even with Hillary Clinton in the polls. But if anyone thought he'd moderate his tone for the general election, they were mistaken. Hillary, rotten Clinton. Crooked Hillary Clinton. Indeed, the brash billionaire was ready for more trash talk and not just about his opponent. Here, you can have it. Anybody want? In his first debate with Secretary Clinton, he seemed to go out of his way to attack Rosie O'Donnell. Rosie O'Donnell, I said very tough things to her, and I think everybody would agree that she deserves it, and nobody feels sorry for her. And after Secretary Clinton mentioned her name... He called this woman Miss Piggy. He would soon take on former Miss Universe Alicia Machado. She gained a massive amount of weight, and uh, it, was, it was a real problem. Then in early October, comments captured on tape by a hot mic in 2005 were released. In the tape, Trump shared lewd comments with Access Hollywood host Billy Bush. When you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the <laughs> I can do anything. After that, 11 women spoke out, claiming to have been sexually harassed by Donald Trump. The events never happened. Never. With about one month to go before Election Day, Trump looked like he was in deep trouble. What a campaign it's been. The long, winding road to the White House ends here. The polls are set to close. In the early hours, the race is close, certainly closer than predicted by those who thought Secretary Clinton was a shoe-in. The feeling was Trump would have to take the swing states of Florida, North Carolina, and Ohio just to have a chance. At 10.30... A victory for Donald Trump in Ohio uh, can be called by the Fox News decision desk at this point. At 10.45, North, North Carolina, Carolina goes to Trump. On Monday morning, they had a much bigger lead in absentee and early voting. There were 122,000 more Republicans who turned out and voted early or voted absentee, and 22,000 fewer Democrats who voted early or absentee compared to four years ago. So on Monday morning, I said, you know, looked at those numbers and said, he's going to take North Carolina unless Election Day is considerably different than Election Days have tended to be. Then around 11 p.m., 
Donald Trump will win the state of Florida, according to the Fox News decision desk. Now it was anyone's game. Are you starting to feel that Hillary Clinton might lose this thing? Uh, I'm nervous. 11:30, Trump wins Wisconsin. Then at 2:41, when he won another Rust Belt state, the biggest, Pennsylvania, it put him over the top. This means that Donald Trump will be the 45th president of the United States, winning the most unreal. <laughs> surreal election we have ever seen. Election night was absolutely euphoric here in this room. It wasn't until he saw the 270 number be surpassed that he knew it was real. But it also was a complete vindication of the way he ran his campaign on his terms, with his own style and with his own message. Donald Trump fought a campaign not just against candidates, but against conventional wisdom. And he won. The pundits didn't think he could do it. But the people did. He'd obviously struck a nerve. We'll look at that when we return. <laughs> Donald Trump's success, it's safe to say, came as a surprise to the political and media class. This is partly because he seized upon issues that mattered deeply to a lot of Americans who'd felt long ignored. One such issue, trade. Oh! From the start of his campaign, Donald Trump's economic populism made him a favorite among white working class voters. President Trump! President Trump! The best way to stay competitive and protect the business for long term is to move production from our facility in Indianapolis to Monterey, Mexico. <laughs> This video shows the moment when 1,400 workers at Carrier Air Conditioning were told their jobs will be shipped from Indianapolis to Mexico in 2017. We're moving. We're shutting down. We're moving to Monterey, Mexico. Starting and it's like, wow, uh, really? Mark Weddle, a Carrier employee for nearly a quarter century, was there when management made that announcement. I want to be clear. This is strictly a business decision. Yeah. <laughs> some people were hollering, some people were, you know, raising some cane. You heard one guy said, F you. Yeah. Dave Hartsock was a carrier employee of 13 years. And that one guy really said it all for everybody. I looked up and I heard somebody crying. I looked up and my friend Cheryl, I mean, she's crying. And it's like, it just, it just devastated her. I was just, you know, basically numb. I just didn't know what the hell to think. Just days later, at a Republican debate, Donald Trump was the only candidate to speak about the mass layoff. All of these 1,400 people that are being laid off, they're laid off. They were crying. They were, it was a very sad situation. He explained what he would do to carry her if he was elected president. I am going to get consensus from Congress, and we're going to tax you when those air conditions come. So stay where you are or build in the United States. That sort of talk directly contradicted decades of Republican thinking on free trade. I did catch out on the news that he brought up Carrier. I thought, hell yeah, about time somebody say something. Though Mark Weddle is a Democrat and a union member, this time he decided to support Trump. I believe the entire political system is going to be different from now on. It needs to be changed, you know. Nothing gets done. Nothing happens that benefits the American people. It's benefiting somebody else. If we let everybody go to Mexico, we're not going to have any jobs for our grandchildren. I think everybody's just mad and they got fed up with the government letting things like this happen. I appreciate any candidate that's going to do more to keep jobs in America. I hope we can save my job and, and everybody else's job that's in the same situation. This is not the first factory that's closed down. Another example is Niagara Ceramics in Buffalo, New York, which closed in 2013. It was just impossible for us to compete with the foreign market. Joe Bronco was a vice president very difficult for us to manufacture a product in the USA at dollars per piece more than you could buy it for landed at a port 
on either coast. Today, the old warehouse feels almost haunted, not by ghosts, but by memories of when the factory employed more than 400 skilled workers. We held on as long as we could, and uh, we just couldn't do it. Bronco was down, but not out. He's opened a new ceramics facility in Rochester, New York, called North Star Ceramics, much smaller, but growing. Donald Trump made it very clear that we've made some bad trade deals, and they're affecting um, businesses like me today, and we are definitely not working on a level playing field. Joe felt so strongly about it, he and his family worked to get Trump elected. The fact that, that Donald Trump is a businessman is, is playing a uh, huge factor in, in my support of him. I mean, he understands what it's like to be where I am in a much larger scale. Before he entered politics, New York Congressman Chris Collins was personally involved in securing funding that kept Niagara Ceramics afloat for several years. And then he became the first congressman to support Trump. Today, he is Trump's congressional liaison during the transition. Were you ever nervous jumping on the Trump train so early? I was never nervous. It was an easy decision for me to make coming from Western New York, which has been devastated by bad trade deals. When it is President Trump, how do you think he will help jobs come back to upstate New York? We're going to have to negotiate trade deals, and there may well be some tariff type of barriers to level the playing field. It's got to be fair trade. When I'm president, if a company wants to fire their workers and leave for Mexico or other countries, then we will charge them a 35% tax when they want to ship their products back into the United States. I don't believe that President Ford is now going to follow through and move those small cars to Mexico. I think that's a decision he's going to reverse. When you start talking tariffs, you've heard the critics that say those jobs are gone for good. You don't buy it. Not everyone is going to be you know, in the STEM world, a scientist, an engineer, a physician. Those are great jobs, but let's just be honest with ourselves. So where are the good jobs? And it's not in the lower uh, paid uh, service uh, industries. It's making stuff, what we used to do. And we've got to level the playing field. The frustrations and even anger of the working class played a central role in the 2016 election. But how is it that a celebrity billionaire came to be their voice? That's next. Most presidential biographies describe years of rising through the ranks before achieving the top job. That will not be the case with Donald Trump. Nevertheless, to those who think his candidacy came out of nowhere, there's actually a lot of history leading up to it. In fact, a lifetime's worth. Donald John Trump, son of Fred and Mary Trump, was born June 14, 1946, in Queens, New York. Fred was a real estate developer, specializing in middle-income apartments. Young Donald grew up around building sites and construction workers. But he had a rebellious streak, and Fred was a no-nonsense father. He sent his son to a military school the New York Military Academy. My father raves about military school. He often says it's the best thing that ever happened to him. It gave him a lot of discipline. I think that's uh, Donald there. See, he's the biggest guy. Ted Levine went to military school with Trump. They became friends, perhaps the first time Trump connected with one of the little people. He did protect me a lot from bullies. When he said, don't go near Levine, they didn't go near Levine. Even back then, the young Trump was a mighty competitor. He was a great athlete. Anything he wanted to do, he could be the first. He far exceeded what the rest of the group was like as far as his talent. Trump followed his father into real estate. In 1971, he was given full control of the family company, which he renamed the Trump Organization. But Trump wasn't your average real estate developer. He had a taste for the spotlight and was regularly seen on the town with a beautiful woman on his arm. In 1977, he married Ivana Zelnikova, a fashion model from Czechoslovakia. Together, they became an inescapable part of the Manhattan scene. In 1983, Trump opened up his flagship building on Fifth Avenue, 
Trump Tower. In 1987, he published his bestseller, The Art of the Deal. Trump had become a national figure. You never knew where he'd show up next. Way back then, Mike Dunbar, a GOP activist from New Hampshire, saw political promise in the billionaire. Dunbar liked the idea of a businessman who could get things done. And so that's why I started a draft Trump campaign. And so in October 1987, at Yokin's restaurant in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, as people waved Trump for president signs, Donald Trump made his first campaign speech. Speaking without notes, he hit on some of the same economic themes that propelled him to the White House. The message in 1987 uh, didn't change just the players. Back then it was Japan and Saudi Arabia. Today it's China and Mexico. We're still getting our lunch eaten by uh, our trading partners. And the people who are hurting are people like me, people who work for a living. We're the ones who are feeling it. So Trump appeals to us. After the speech, they left the restaurant and moved Trump to a nearby press conference. And I had to get him from the speaker's podium to a side door, which was a pretty good distance. And as we moved along, he kept stopping, shaking hands with the wait staff, with the cops, and with the firemen who were there. He ignored all the other people wearing the suits and everything else, but he, it was the common man that attracted Donald Trump and that he reached out to. And I think that's what's happening today. He's still reaching out to us, not to the guys in the suits. He didn't run back then. But the seed had been planted. In the 90s, his business ventures had some ups and downs. And so did his love life. We have a great relationship. We've always had a great relationship. And it's, uh, it's fine. He divorced Ivana in 1991. He then married actress Marla Maples in 1993. Well, I think it was just a relationship that was happening. And it just feels real good. And divorced her in 1999. In 2004, his profile rose as never before when he became the star of NBC's hit show, The Apprentice. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. You know what, Summer? You're fired. And he married his present-day wife, Slovenian model Melania Naus, in 2005. But Trump never stopped thinking about politics. And as he entered his 60s, if he was serious about a run, he could no longer play the waiting game. He asked Kellyanne Conway, president and CEO of the polling company, to do some research to see where he would stand in the 2012 race. What was missing from the field for many Republican voters in, in 2011 was somebody who was not a typical politician, somebody who would be an outsider to the system in Washington, but also somebody who was not completely unfamiliar to them. Years later, of course, Conway herself would play a major role in Trump's campaign. But in 2011, Trump wasn't yet ready to throw his hat in the ring. Instead, he endorsed Republican candidate Mitt Romney, another businessman who sold himself as someone who could get things done. But when Romney lost, it was now or never for Trump. He started to put together a staff. He also started connecting with conservative media outlets and organizations and gave speeches at places like CPAC. I'm not doing this for fun. I'm doing it because we have to take our country back. One person he met with in early 2015, Newt Gingrich. He asked very probing, intelligent questions about, you know, what does it take physically and how do you schedule it and how do you balance yourself? What would it cost from January of 2015 through South Carolina? I said probably between 70 and 80 million. And he thought for a minute, he said, a yacht. So this would, be, this would be more interesting than a yacht. So I sort of thought at that point he's going. By the time Trump announced his run, he was ready. And if the rest of the candidates were not ready for him, the public was. Donald Trump has described his campaign as a movement. And that movement has been collecting some unlikely voices. We'll talk to some of them when we return. To win the election, Donald Trump brought a lot of new voters to his party. And as you're about to see, many of them were filled with surprises. Remember Bob Holmes, the New Hampshire tattoo artist, the one who just voted for the first time? You know, everybody's trying to be politically correct, but nobody says anything. 
because you don't want to step on toes or you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings or you don't want to be called a racist or whatever. And I think that he's saying exactly what everybody wants to say. I'm the one that brought all the action, right? The Seabrook, New Hampshire tattoo artist was offering free Trump tattoos when we first met him earlier this year. Business was brisk. And varied between Make America Great Again and, and the actual Trump head. Yeah, we've done his face and all the rest are either, you know, we the people tattoos with let's make America great again. When you're putting on the tattoo and doing it, do you talk issues like what drives these people to do it? You know, they're just really supportive and they want to feel like America's great again. They want to feel like they're going to be secure, that they're not going to have to worry about things happening to their kids or them. So they love the fact that Donald Trump says what he says um, and owns it. One of those on the receiving end was Max Crowley, a Trump fan who came in from Massachusetts to get his free tattoo. I got a Trump tattoo on the back of my calf, and it's his portrait. I mean, that's kind of a permanent deal. It, it is. You're in. I'm in. I'm in 100%. There's no going back on that now. It's there forever. Let's see it. You want to see it? And there he is. How about that? The Donald. The Donald. To Crowley, the billionaire businessman represents hope for the working man. As a construction worker and a carpenter, work has not been great um, for the past couple of years. It's been hard, you know, especially with a family supporting them. And as a business class kind of guy, um, you know, he promises a lot of good things for the future, and the future is everything to me and my family. So now you can look at your leg and get inspired. That's it. Absolutely correct. I'm behind Donald Trump 100%, and now Donald Trump is behind me. <laughs> is this a voter revolt, you think? I think it's a revolt against the politicians that are running the country now and doing such a bang-up job. I think it's time, and everybody else thinks it's time, to change it. Holmes wasn't alone in finding a new political direction. Fox News reporting found itself in the middle of a clash over the future of the Republican Party at the Virginia GOP convention. Well, Mr. Trump has been in five different parties in the last 10 different years. He's given over $700,000 to the Democrats. We're not exactly sure. I used to be a Democrat for 30 years, and that man convinced me to be a Republican. Who gives a if he I changed do. over time? I Why? Do. So you don't want my vote? I'm a Republican now, and I want the Republican Party? So you're saying if you grew up as a Republican, I, then I'm you're not, better than me as a Democrat? I'm not yelling oh, at you. Crap. That Trump supporter you know, you know was what? Cheryl Ann Kraft, a nurse who works for the Department of Defense in Norfolk. I was a 30-year Democrat. The fact that somebody says that Mr. Trump, because his opinions and his positions have changed over the years, is not a valid Republican conservative to, that could run for the office is absolutely wrong. Another person transformed by the Trump campaign was Chris Cox. Cox makes his living by creating chainsaw sculpture. As long as I've got a couple logs and a chainsaw, I can turn it into something that will typically put some gas in my truck and a pillow under my head. As founder of Bikers for Trump, he told us Trump is just what the doctor ordered. Donald Trump's going to bring some dignity back to our country. He's going to give us a sense of direction. We need America back. We want our country back, and we're going to get it back. This is a movement, and it's happening right now. The establishment's coming on board. We'll see who holds out. The ones that are there, they better fall in line. They better start making some things happen, and they better start representing the people that put them there. We caught up with Cox in D.C. after the election. The reaction of the left, it just exemplified our need for Donald Trump. They need to get over it because we won. And uh, we're going to be very good stewards of this leadership. And Donald Trump's going to change the direction of this country. And the Democrats, they have no one to blame but themselves. If they, wanna wonder, if they wonder how we got to Donald Trump, ask Barack Obama and his policies. I'm not a wilting flower. I am first a conservative, I'm a mother, I'm a you know educated person, I'm an attorney, and oh yeah, I'm a woman too. Former federal prosecutor Tamara Neo from Southern Virginia 
told us that for her at least, the reports of Trump mistreatment of women were outweighed by other concerns. He has the courage and, and the fortitude, obviously, to withstand all the blowback from saying what he's saying about Muslim immigration and the difficulties that lie there, building a wall and illegal immigration, and just one issue after the next after the next. He's willing to say what, frankly, I think most of us were thinking, and he can take the blowback from it. We need someone to take a sledgehammer to this bull there's, there's There is no other way around it. Cody Knotts is a Republican from rural Pennsylvania who directs low-budget horror films. He told us he considers himself a Reagan man, but also says Donald Trump is the only candidate he trusts to take action on the economy. None of them want to change trade policy. They all want to sell out the average working man so their buddies can make more money. Is he the best messenger? No, but he's the only messenger we got. In voting for Trump, Cody joined a wave in Pennsylvania that saw many districts that voted heavily for President Obama in 2012, surprisingly going to Trump this time around. When I found out Donald Trump had won, I started crying. Finally, somebody gave a damn that my dad lost his job. Somebody cared. Now, he might be a charlatan, he might be all those things, but he gave a damn. The Clintons and them put past these trade deals, and I knew what they did. If he screws up the whole presidency, for me, it was worth it. At a core level, it was voting for my dad. As Shakespeare wrote, what's past is prologue. So far, we've been looking at what led us up to this historic moment. When we return, we'll discuss what this past may be prologue to. In the 1972 film, The Candidate, where Robert Redford's character runs an underdog Senate campaign, the last line he says after winning the election is, what do we do now? While the film is an often cynical take on American politics, this is nevertheless a question that must have gone through the mind of many a politician. After getting caught up in the hurly-burly of a campaign, you suddenly find you're no longer running and now are expected to lead. It's likely many in the Trump circle must be asking that same question. What do we do now? And certainly, even more Americans are asking, what will he do next? And yes, we will build a great wall. Of all the promises candidate Donald Trump made, the one that got the most attention was the wall. Will he be able to build it? Kellyanne Conway has little doubt. He will build the wall. Mexico will pay for it. Immigration has always been what's fair to the illegal immigrant. And as Donald Trump, as candidate and as president, has promised to also say, hey, what's fair to the American worker? He is going to make good on all of these promises. Carl Rove believes the people may allow a little give. As I travel out, people say I'm for Trump. And we get talking about the issues. I'd say, do you really think you'll be able to build a wall and make Mexico pay for it? Every person I ran across said, oh, no, 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 no. No, but you know what? He'll secure our borders. This is for everybody. He will definitely see defiance when it comes to deporting illegal immigrants. Mayors of major American cities vow they will remain sanctuary cities. To be clear about what Chicago is, it always will be a sanctuary city. And he may find resistance even within his own party. You're not on the same page on immigration, at least uh, well, on the campaign I don't, trail. I don't really agree with that. We are on the same page on securing the border. And that border security first is what Donald, what, what President-elect Trump is talking about, and that's something we all totally agree with. On the ground, on the ground, and get suelo, and get suelo, and get suelo. And the deportation force. Well, I think right now we, we want to secure the border, and that is really first the first priority. As for repealing and replacing Obamacare, we're told that is still on track. While Trump has talked about keeping two elements of Obamacare, letting kids stay on their parents' plan till they're 26, and making sure people with pre-existing conditions are still covered. It happens to be one of the strongest assets. You're going to keep that. Obama's legacy, the, the main thing is, of course, Obamacare. And he's already started to backtrack on that. Thomas Frank is the author of Listen Liberal. If you look at Obamacare, there are certain aspects of it that are massively popular. And to undo them would be to kill your own political future. 
I think what he'll do is he'll fiddle around with it uh, and call it Trump Care. You know, <laughs> he'll he'll adjust it in this way and that. No, he will make good on his promises. The fact that there's about 33,000 pages in the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, and I'm sure you can find one or two good things in 33,000 pages. I mean, even a stop clock tells the right time twice a day. Uh, having said that, he's made very clear what his replacement plan is. Trump also has big plans for infrastructure spending, as outlined in his victory speech. We are going to fix our inner cities and rebuild our highways, bridges, tunnels, airports, schools, hospitals. We're going to rebuild our infrastructure. And we will put millions of our people to work as we rebuild it. I think this is going to be a battle. He's got two battles there. One is going to be a battle with the Democrats because, look, they're not going to, they may not consider whatever he wants to spend sufficient. And second of all, he's going to have a battle with Republicans who spent the last eight years belittling the stimulus bill. Then there's his promise to drain the swamp of Washington. When he talks about draining the swamp and reducing the size of federal government, eliminating the regulations that have choked off our economy and this obnoxious revolving door of individuals making millions of dollars based on contacts. There is no question that's all going to happen. I can understand why many of the lobbyists and consultants in Washington, D.C. are just incredibly nervous that they that their gravy train is going to be busted off the wheels and the engine ripped out with him as president because it has to stop. The joke I used to say to folks when I came here four years ago and, and bought a condominium, I said, if I do my job, I'm going to lose a lot of money on that condominium because there's going to be a surplus of places to rent and own as we do drain the swamp and reduce uh, the number of federal employees. Um, I'm quite happy to lose money on that investment. He's made other promises, of course, renegotiate trade deals, strengthen the U.S. military, increase educational opportunities. In general, though, make America great again. I think they elected him because they said Barack Obama is doing stuff to our country that we totally disagree with and this guy is going to be a strong leader who will secure our borders, make America's military strong again, uh, make our country respected around the world, get good trade deals, but most important of all, he will get the economy going again. There will be better jobs and bigger paychecks. Come this January, when he's sworn into office. Donald Trump's plans will finally be tested by the real world. How well they work out will help determine not just what sort of presidency Trump will have, but what sort of country we'll be living in. Eight years ago, many Americans thought we were on the verge of a new era. The Democrats had won the White House, held both chambers of Congress, and seemed on the verge of turning the U.S. Supreme Court. Today, all of that's reversed. Politics works that way sometimes. President-elect Trump is a controversial figure, but now it's his job to prove to Americans that they made the right choice. And in the next four years, perhaps we'll see whether the Trump revolution is the beginning of a new era itself or just another swing of the pendulum. That's our program. Thanks for watching.